Shalom, peace be with you. Psalm 119, verse 38. A directory translated in English as Erect or establish in your servant your pure spoken words within me so that I can be devoted and live completely and utterly in your sacred fear alone. When you decide to go for deliverance, this is the first thinking pattern that you will adopt right from the start. There is no turning back. Playtime and dancing with the world is over. Game over, full stop. I would like to pray first before I go on. Adonai, I worship your holy name. I bow down before your holy throne. I ask you to please put a watch in front of my mouth that I'll only speak in this testimony on what the Holy Spirit wants and that you will also knot my tongue so that I, can, that I do not speak anything out of my own self. I thank you and I glorify your almighty name in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. I personally call Jesus Christ by his original Hebrew name, Yahushua, or for short, Yeshua HaMashiach, but mostly Yeshua or Yeshua HaMashiach. HaMashiach means the Messiah or the Christ. I do not use his English name, but there is nothing wrong with using his name in your own language. I just prefer to use his Hebrew name for the reason that I understand and speak Hebrew to the Lord as a second language. My entire past was nothing more than poverty, rejection, unwantedness, the fifth wheel on the wagon, a nuisance to all humanity, and one big fat disaster destined for the dustbin. Two years before my deliverance, I've lost everything, all my businesses, my home, etc. I was left with only my vehicle, and due to that, I landed up in the howling wasted desert of a no man's land, and the Lord found me there, and He took me in and instructed me for the first 16 months. And He made me the apple of His eye. Just like Deuteronomy 32 verse 10 says, the old King James Bible at first was all I had for years, but that was not deep enough. So I took on a biblical Hebrew course so that I can start understanding the Hebrew Bible, the deepest, the most trustworthy version of the Old Testament. And so I started the course with one of the retired professors at one of the universities of South Africa in his personal capacity in January 2020, so that I can understand the Bible in its original text. I had enough of people's opinions about who the God of Abram, Isaac and Israel really is. I refer to Israel as Jacob. Everyone in his own limited human version of the word of the Lord, whatever they are a pastor, they are a reverend, they are a priest, they are a professor, they are a preacher, or anybody else has their own opinion. And I had enough of that. Any person on the face of the earth that understands English and that are planning to go for deliverance, or are in the process of it, or have gone through it already recently, this testimony is for you. You might not agree with everything I say here, but this is the journey that the Lord took me through and taught me during the first year and a few months after my deliverance. And no one can take that away from me. You can take from it what you can learn from it. This voice note can mean the difference between life and death for you. We have an enemy and his name is Satan. Lucifer, the devil, that was thrown out of heaven and landed up on the earth. And he, did, and he was destroyed with his own dark and sinful nature as recorded and thrown out of heaven as recorded in Genesis 1 verse 2. Satan also fell from heaven and was cast down to the ground, the earth, to weaken the nations as written by, a prof, prof, sorry, as written by prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 14 verse 12. Yeshua himself also saw that how Lucifer was thrown out of heaven, according to Luke 10, 18. Mark my words today. Satan, Lucifer, the devil, is out to kill you, to destroy you, to rob you. 
but Yeshua has come to give you life and life in abundance as he says in John 10 verse 10 you need to know who your enemy is out there you cannot see him but he's out there and you also need to know that once you go for deliverance stop playing church church stop playing games with the almighty father in heaven and you stop sinning altogether Yes, you heard me correctly. Stop sinning, full stop. If you wish to continue your process with deliverance, I strongly advise that you keep on listening to this testimony, which can save you from Satan destroying you seven times more than ever before, according to Matthew 12, verse 45, Yeshua's own words. I was referred to Kut Yodan from Stand Up for Jesus by one of his close family members. So I started the process of preparing in the beginning of July 2020 and six weeks later on the 27th of August 2020 I went through the proper deliverance for the first time after four previous unsuccessful attempts. Today, more than 16 months later, I am still as free as what I was the day the Lord delivered me from my entire past as well as eight generations of bloodline curses. This is my story and my personal testimony and I would like to prefer to stay anonymous. Good course the process four times hundred meter. There are three steps to go through deliverance and the fourth step is to stay in deliverance and do not slide back into the hands of Satan from whom you were delivered by Yeshua himself. Okay, the first hundred meter. At first, Kurt sends me 55 questions regarding all my history and background to answer, which I sent back to him, and he and his team waited on the Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit revealed the truth to them. When I answered these 55 questions, I made very sure I answered them in detail, And the more info, the better. I made sure I did not leave anything out, no matter how much it hurts. Here is a stern warning. Not everyone that says they do deliverance is called by the Holy Spirit and anointed by Him to do so. As I said early on, before I came to Kut, I was at four other people that say they do deliverance, but not one of them could get down to the real root of the real problem. They all said it is rejection, severe rejection. Because my rejection problem started in my mother's womb already. Even before I was born, it was already in full swing. But no one seems to have bothered to look any further than my time in the womb. Because the root of the problem started already way back with my ancestors. A few centuries before I was born. Eight generations. When Kurt and his team came back to me on what the Holy Spirit showed them, it was shocking and very unexpected. The root was not rejection at all. Rejection was only the branches going out of the main root. But the real root was the death and murder. Yes, death and murder. And out of that same root came the branches of rejection. By trying to kill the branches coming out of the root is not going to kill the root. The branches will just grow again out of the root. That is why my deliverance never worked before. The root was not killed at all. It was only the branches of rejection that was cut back every time. So it keeps on recurring and recurring. Deliverance will never work if the root is not killed and removed. And that only the Holy Spirit can do. Now this is what the Holy Spirit did in all my bloodline curses. He uprooted the entire root together with the branches. So there was nothing left of this death and murder curse to grow on. Any further? For me, this is the one and only deliverance I ever had. And it was also going to be the last one for the root of death and murder. There is also something you clearly need to understand here. 
For each person that you have sex with, you carry those family bloodlines from each of those people with you unknowingly. And you have them together with the curses of your own mom and dad's bloodlines. Whether they died or still alive. When your grandpa dies, the demonic spirit in him does not die with him. It moves down to the next generation. To your dad. And then to you. And then to your kids. And your grandchildren. And your great-grandchildren, etc. You can only break these curses by deliverance by the blood of Yeshua alone. Nothing else could prepare me properly for this job where after the Holy Spirit took over completely. The second hundred meter is getting the hundred percent pure gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. The pure gospel of Jesus Christ, with other words. Once all that was revealed in the first hundred meter, the second hundred meter comes where you get exposed to the full pure gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. The one according to both the New and the Old Testament. The entire Bible. And not according to what you get taught in children's church, Sunday school, cell group, mass for the Catholics. They will know what I'm talking about. And church or what your priest, your reverend, your pastor or your church manifest says. For me, those days are finally over. I was so hungry for the word that I wanted to get to the bottom of the full truth of the word of the Lord. And that I could only find, I could not find that in any church uh, denomination I went to. And believe me, I went to hundreds of them through my life. At this point, I was really exposed eight months to the Hebrew language due to my studies already when I went through deliverance. And that took me deeper that I could start understanding and read the word myself. In the Old Testament, at least in its original language that was spoken out of the mouth of the Lord Himself through Moses and the other prophets. The language that the Father spoke to them was Hebrew. That's the one I went and studied. I am now at the place where my intimate relationship with the Father is 65% in English and 35% in Hebrew. Modern Hebrew, please. I cannot understand it, um, classical Hebrew yet because there's no vowels in it. Okay, and hopefully it will start moving more and more in the direction of Hebrew becoming the language of my relationship with the Lord utterly and completely. Meaning that is the only language I will eventually speak into Him, and that's Hebrew. Okay. The Hebrew language is not very easy to learn. It also has its own alphabet and you need to learn it from scratch. The grammar is much more challenging than any modern language today, but it helped me to go into deep levels of the word itself by the complete guidance of the Holy Spirit alone. I ate and ate the word and I'm still doing it up to today. I feel that I don't get full enough of the word. After losing everything and being locked down with the COVID, that is all I had to do. was locked in my house, couldn't go anywhere. So what I had, everything was online on internet, YouTube, and uh, interlinear Bibles, etc. And I took advantage of the COVID lockdowns to go deep and deep in the word of the Lord and increasing my knowledge and understanding the understanding of the Hebrew language without coming near a church or even listening to any church streaming in the past year and a half. Every Sabbath day I did Shabbat in Hebrew. The Hebrew and the Greek Bibles and the Holy Spirit is all I had that I will never, that I will ever need for my relationship with the Father. People cannot give it to you, only the Holy Spirit can. But you must be able to hear His voice loud and clear. If you do not have the Old Testament as a solid foundation of your Christian life, you are doomed to for a fall, and Satan can easily pull you back into his world, worldly kingdom and lead you astray. The Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis to Deuteronomy, is the most vital foundation of the Christian life you will ever have. I'm not talking about the Talmud, the Jewish Talmud. I'm not talking about that. That's not the pure Torah. Okay? I'm talking about the original written word by the original prophets. Christianity does not start in the book of Matthew. 
I say again, Christianity is, does not start in the book of Matthew. It starts in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. There is an exceptionally good reason why the Old Testament takes up three quarters of your Bible and the New Testament only a quarter. You cannot survive as a Christian by only using the New Testament and Psalms. The Old Testament is extremely important for you as a newborn Christian and especially even more if you had deliverance. Out of the, um, the Jewish or the Israel nation, Christianity was born. Because Yeshua was a born and bred Jew from the tribe of Judah and could only become the Messiah after his resurrection when Christianity was born. The Old Testament scrolls was Yeshua's only Bible he had on earth. And he still insists that people do the same to take the Old Testament as foundation for their faith. If you are hungry enough and you seek him diligently, he will make a way where there is no way. Ask me, I can testify of that. And it's worth it without having a cent on my name. If you seek him diligently, he will reward you as written in Hebrews 6, sorry, Hebrews 11 verse 6. Where there is a will, there is a way. The third hundred meter. This is where the deliverance takes place. Now this is the easy part. Because there is, here you do just nothing. The Holy Spirit does it all by himself. It just, you just have to confess all your lifelong sins according to that 55 or more questions feedback. Uh, and the extra ones which the Holy Spirit showed me. I had about 68 questions at the end of mine. Because I added new things which the Holy Spirit showed me. Um, while I was preparing during the second hundred meter. Okay, at last, six weeks later on Thursday, 27th of August, 2020, I was, or I was ready and could also get the go-ahead from the Holy Spirit. If not, we have to wait until the Holy Spirit gives him the go-ahead. Otherwise, I'm not ready. And could make 100% sure I was ready for the 300 meter before he sent me the voice notes. Could was however was nowhere near me he was at his house i was at my house a vast number of kilometers apart in two cities he only sent me the voice notes for the deliverance and i did it in my room behind closed doors on my laptop alone on my knees on the floor successfully with only me and the holy spirit present in my room could did not lay any hand on me you have to make absolutely sure that you are you really want to go through deliverance before you do it. Once you are there and you are through it successfully, there is no turning back. So please make absolutely sure because you do not know what might happen to you after the deliverance. The Holy Spirit does not do a half job at all. It is a huge job He does. Larger than what you will ever think or imagine. That is why your aftercare must be 100% Bible orientated. The 66 books orientated in the Bible. The Hebrew Bible in Psalms 119 verse 105 makes it noticeably clear. Your only spoken word is the only lamp to my feet and the only light to my pathway in my life. That's if you translate it directly. You cannot have any other compass or guidance besides the true word of the Lord of your deliverance. You have to eat the word up like sweet cakes. Because Psalm 119 verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your words are seated in the heaven permanently forever, and nothing can remove it. The full word of the Lord, all six, six books of the entire Bible will stand forever. Just something remarkably interesting, which is very unique to the Hebrew Bible. All 176 verses in Psalms 119, the longest Psalms in the book, in the Bible, will tell you the importance of the word of the Lord or His spoken word. It is like a summary of the entire Bible in a nutshell. 
with each eight verses starting with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, times 8 gives you 176 verses. When you read the Hebrew Bible, you will see, for example, that the first eight verses starts with an Aleph, the first word of each verse. The, that's, Aleph is a silent cons, uh, consonant that takes the place of any vowel like A, E, I, O, U. Okay, the second eight verses starts with a bait, which is a B for boy. The third eight voice, v, uh, verses are, start with a Gimel, which is a G for girl, etc. And so you can carry on till the last letter from verse 169 to 176, which is the tough. The, it's one of the two T's, uh, which mainly used for tall. If you say tall, those are the, the tough. So that's the last alphabet of the Hebrew letter, and that's all the last also the last eight verses in Psalm 119. You will not find the sequence in any, in any other Bible translation. It's only be found in the original Hebrew text as written by the psalmist. Psalm 119 is directly the same as what Yeshua spoke about in Matthew 5 verse 18, which is, which is directly translated from the Greek as, For I mean, so it will be. I am saying to you, until heaven and earth should be passing by, not one letter or one jot or title may be at no means be taken away from the law until the earth shall be fulfilled until the end of time or heaven and earth shall be passing. Yeshua once again said in John to John in Revelation 22 verse 19 directly translated from the Greek and if anyone should be removing anything from the words of the scroll of this prophecy, God shall eliminate his part from the log of life and out of the holy city which is written in the scroll. The holy city is referring to the new Jerusalem. And okay, the word scroll is referring to the entire word of the Lord, his spoken word or 66 books of the Bible. In the time of John, the only, they, the only papers they had uh, available to write on was scrolls. They didn't have computers and things like that. Today in Jerusalem at the main synagogue, the entire Old Testament is laid out. They, they are all written in scrolls in the classical Hebrew. If you remove anything from the laws of the words of the Lord that he spoke, he will take your name out of the Lamb's Book of Life. If your name is not there on Judgment Day, you will be thrown into the lake of fire together with Satan and all his demons according to Revelation 20 verse 15. This is how the Lord feels about his own word. It is holy and it's sacred. The Lord can call you for full-time ministry once you've been del uh, through deliverance. You never know. And once he does that, there's no way out. You have to deny yourself your own self 100% and follow Yeshua. If you cannot do that, you are not worthy of Him. Yeshua Himself said it in Matthew 10.38. And I quote from the direct translation from the Greek Bible once again. And he that does not take up his cross and follow after me, lay down all he has for me alone, is not worthy of me. Once you are set free, you are a target and a great threat to Satan. And you need to die to yourself and follow Yeshua with all that's within you, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20. A quote from the Greek. Okay, I'm going to use the, the, the Greek version of, of Yeshua's names. In Christo, that's in Christ, I'm crucified. I no longer live of my own will, but Christo lives in me. Even through, I still live in a human body. Okay. If you get called for full-time ministry and you try to get out of it, the Lord will not allow you. Mark my words, He will not allow you. Full stop. Comes hell or high water. It's not going to work. The word says in Colossians 1 verse 13 and 14, I quote from the Greek, The, uh, the Father who had delivered you from the dominion of darkness and has translated you under the full authority, the rulership and the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom you have full redemption through the blood, through his blood, sorry, as well as the forgiveness of all your sins. 
the Greek word metas, uh, sorry, let me just try again. Metastesin means transferred us, which means to move something from one place to another permanently, never to return again. You are not transferable back to the way you lived. You stay under His control. If you try and move out under it, you are sinning, the sin of pride, and Satan is sin. And he lies at the door, peeping at you, just as the Lord said to Cain in Genesis 3 verse 7. Okay, that is now deliverance. Now, now comes the hard part. The fourth hundred meter life after deliverance pulls. I call it pulls because this is a pulls. Um, I am going to give you valuable pulls. I'm going to give you concerning this. Your life, once you finish with the 300 meter. This is now where the hard part starts, as I said earlier on. Once you've been through final deliverance, could steers you a final voice note. And he calls it the fourth and the final 100 meter with valuable pills on how you should continue from there onwards with the Holy Spirit alone. There is several points that he advise in this voice note, and you need to adhere to them all in order that you cannot fall back into these chains again. Like in my case, the chains of death and murder. Because the evil spirit will come back seven times worse than himself. I mean, I know that death and murder was worse, was bad on me. Now, if I'm going to fall back, that thing can even be worse, plus seven extra, times seven. Okay, then your state of your life will be worse than your deliverance, before your deliverance. As Yeshua himself warned us in Matthew 12:45. That is why I said earlier on, you must think very carefully before you do deliverance. There's a huge price to pay. But it's worth doing it. Now listen very carefully. If you, do want, to, if you want to keep on sinning after your deliverance, then you are full of pride, pride and more pride. I cannot stress it hard enough. Rather, do not go for deliverance then. I repeat. If you want to keep on sinning after your deliverance, you are full of pride. So rather stay away from it. You cannot please the Lord with sin. There are important points on this last 400 meter voice note that you must implement straight after your deliverance. I will discuss a few of them as well as one new one that the Holy Spirit taught me in my walk with him and that is tabernacle of Moses you will notice it when I get there okay first of all the first thing confession of sins and warfare at this point could also send me the long confession sins prayer okay I, that's what I call it he just says it's a letter I just called it that okay, and that you must at least work through preferably twice a week once or twice for the rest of your life you are not supposed to commit any sins of the death penalty ever again those are the sins in the Old Testament if you like this holy the Sabbath they would kill you on the spot those are the death penalty sins any sin is forgiven and forgivable besides if you bless him against the Holy Spirit Matthew 12 31 and 32 Confession of sin as well as your warfare on a regular basis is especially important after your deliverance. You can never ever afford to go without it because Satan is watching you. You are now a threat to him. You need protection and you need to make sure you stay in purity and holiness. It is so vital that you do this prayer at least twice a week or more as the Holy Spirit guides you after your deliverance but at least twice, not less. In my case, I do some form of confession of sin every morning before I do the long con. Yes, and then where off I do the long confession one twice a week. So basically, twice a week and the other five is just normal sin confession. Between, in, in between, you know, and obviously the dress of the warfare according to Ephesians 6 verse 13 to 17, you have to do twice a day. Once in the morning and once in the evenings. 
You just confirm it. You don't have to dress it all the time. You only dress it basically when you do the long sin confession. Okay. And for me, I have to do it this way due to the nature of my calling and because it's very dangerous and it's for my own protection. Okay, second, now I want to really speak about the hard part, the thing that nobody wants to hear. But you're going to have to, you're going to have to listen to this. Because if you're not willing to bow, to stop this, or bow uh, to the Lord's will, and get this out of your life, then you are going to have a big problem. Okay, so people listening to this voice note might think I'm obsessed with sin. No, it's the real facts in the Bible that gets opened up to you when you receive the full pure gospel of Yeshua Mashiach. Satan is sin. The Lord hates sin. I repeat, the Lord hates sin. I repeat again, he hates sin with a passion. Whether you had deliverance or not, he hates it. It's all rooted and underwritten in pride, and the Lord hates pride. Confession of sins is extremely important. You will learn all about this in the 200 meter, right in the beginning of that teaching. What is sin, and how the Lord sees sin, and that you will need to turn away from it. And yes, you have to obey the laws in the Old Testament, because how will you know what sin is, if somebody doesn't tell you that? And who is that someone? None other than our Father in Heaven, through His prophets. The Torah, I mean, I'm talking about, not the oral Torah from the Jews, I'm talking about the Torah, the original Torah, the Protestant Torah, in other words, will tell you that. And now Yeshua did not take away any laws. He actually brought it to its full purpose as him, He, Yeshua, said Himself in Matthew 5.17. Do not think that I have come to abolish, abolish means destroy, abolish is destroy the law, or what the prophets spoke. I have not come to destroy or abolish it, but I have come to fulfill it and bring it to its full right. Just in case you think Moses was not a prophet, do not be mistaken. He was the prophet of all prophets, second in line after Yeshua, according to Deuteronomy 3.14. Because he actually prophesied that there will become a prophet amongst you that you will obey him. You will read about it in Deuteronomy 34 verse 10. That is why Yeshua included Moses as one of the prophets in the scripture. As he was referring to the laws given by Moses in the Torah, plus the other prophets that followed him after him, including Joshua. Joshua was also a prophet. Okay, There are three main kinds of sins. Three. Two of them are spoken about in the Old Testament, in the Torah. The first five books in the Old Testament, and one sin in the New Testament in the book of Matthew. As I said earlier on, the Torah is the basis of the Christian faith. Now, you heard me correctly. I say again, the Torah is the basis of the Christian faith. It was not written for the Jews. It was written for the Jews who are supposed to accept Yeshua as a promised Messiah as well as everyone else like us Gentiles that must also come become born again. Gentiles is people that are non-Jews. The Old Testament saw a Gentile as a heathen or unclean person, not being sanctified by the Lord at that time. All people from any tribe and any nation that accepts Yeshua Mashiach as his Savior and Messiah is part of the Lord's people, just like the Jews were in the Old Testament. The whole Bible is written for us all, including the Torah. No matter if you were born a Jew or a Gentile and became a Christian, we all are part of the body of Yeshua and Yeshua makes the rules. Not us or the churches or the Pope. No ways. The church has been, uh, is seen as the Ecclesia. The Greek word is Ecclesia, which means the body of Christ or the body of Christo. Or in Hebrew, that's in Greek or in Hebrew, the body of Yeshua. We belong to Him. 
and not him to us. Like some people would think. The Lord does not see all sin the same. If everybody tells you that all sin, sins are the same to the Lord, they are lying. So whether you're still a chappy in the cafe, or whether you murder something, God doesn't see it the same way. Some sins are worse than others. And you get punished accordingly. And the consequences are also much larger for some than others. It is important that I explain the differences between the three kinds of sins. Three. One, two, three. We will first look at the Old Testament sins and then the other one in the New Testament thereafter. Okay, the first one, the first kind of sin is, I call it the stone sins, which were in the Old Testament the sin of death penalty. For over 16 months now, I have refrained 100% from all these stone sins. The Lord gives law, um, give laws like in the Ten Commandments of Moses, as well as other laws. You will read about all about it in the Torah. If anybody would disobey these laws or do these sins, they will be killed on the spot with stones. The Lord ordered Moses to get them killed immediately. And there was no grace for those kind of sins at all. You will read all about it in the Torah, as I said now. Kut was one, made a wonderful list of all these sins and where in the Bible you can find them. And they were sins for the death penalty. Today, if you do these stone sins, like the unholying the Sabbath, you will not be killed with stones because Yeshua has brought grace with His blood. But, but, as soon as you commit one of these sins, like, for example, dishonoring the Sabbath day. Satan will put his chains and curses on you. He gets access to your soul and make home in your inner being. And he will control your life. And he will get right in the throne room to attack you. Because the Lord is a righteous God. And he hates sins. Many Christians does not see or understand this. Neither did I. Because they believe there is no enemy. Because they can't see him. And he's invisible. But he's there for sure. And they even see it. Oh, he sure died. If you ask once for forgiveness, you can sin as much as you like. There's always grace. That's not biblical. I'm sorry. The churches teach people those things. It's unbiblical. The only way you can get rid of these chains around your feet is deliverance through Yeshua Mashiach alone. There is no other way. Only by proper deliverance and accepting the full true gospel of Yeshua as He sees it. And not like we or our pastors, our reverends, our preachers and our priests sees it. How Yeshua sees it. How the Father sees it. That's all that matters. I want to discuss one of these stone sins to give you an example. There's a reason why I, I chose this one, because there's a good reason for it. A common one, like most Christians in the Western world, trespasses this one every week. And every week Satan puts chains around them and every week he gets more access into their souls. This is a good example for all, as especially in our modern day. It is the sin of dishonoring the Lord's Sabbath day, or in Hebrew, Shabbat, Yom. Okay, Yom is day in Hebrew. Okay, in Genesis 2, verse 2 and 3, is where the Lord gave the first order to Adam and Eve to obey the Sabbath. Even before they sinned, it was still so important to the Lord for everyone to keep, to keep it, that He Himself, He that's the Creator of the universe, the Almighty God, even kept it himself to teach all human beings that is all human beings that he created and how that it should be done and that they should teach it to the generations further down. This was the father's plan and order. In the Hebrew Bible the word Shabbat oh, sorry, Sabbath is Shabbat. It's just a, a translation from Sabbath. 
The Hebrew Christians and the Jews calls it Shabbat Shalom. Okay, which means to cease from all your work on the seventh day and we will live in eternal peace with the Lord. That is basically why they call it Shabbat Shalom. Shalom means eternal peace with the Lord. Shalom, that's what it means. Okay, and the Jews prefer that. Even in Israel, that if you go walk on to any person and you tell them Shalom, they, they know that they can trust you because you're coming in peace, you're not coming in war. Okay. And that is basically what it says. In the first feast, that was the very first feast that the Lord implemented, which needed to be obeyed by all that follows Him in the Old Testament. Whether you are a Jew before Yeshua's time, or after His time, a Christian or a Messianic Jew, as yes, Jews become Christians, accepting the Messiah, they don't call themselves Christians, they call themselves Messianic Jews, you are commanded to obey it. That's an order from the Lord. End of story. There was no way around it. Not in the Old Testament time, not in the New Testament, and not in the time that we're living now. Yeshua never took it away. In fact, He said in Mark 2 verse 27, that the Sabbath was made for humans, and not humans for the Sabbath. That's His words, which refers back to Genesis 2 verse 2 and 3. That's what he was speaking about when he said that in Mark 2 verse 27. Even when the Israelites was in the promised land in the Old Testament, they were ordered to only work on the lands for six days. On the seventh day, they, had, they and all their servants and the animals and everybody else, as well as the ground, had to rest. That was an order from the Lord. That is when the harvest was given to them in due time by the Lord. Because they obeyed the law of the Sabbath. The Lord also instructed the Israelites to sow and work on the lands for six years. And the seventh year they had to rest. That means for a whole year the ground had to rest. Nothing happened there. It was nobody plowed. Nobody did anything for a whole year. They call it the sabbatical year. Okay? Because the land had also had to rest every seven years as well. This is how the Lord created the earth or the ground to work. The Lord had already demonstrated this prophetically in Exodus 16 by providing food for them, that's the manna, in six days. Which the sixth day, he included the seventh day's food. So on the sixth day, they got double. And so it, you know, and he made sure that that manna didn't didn't went uh, sour or, or the worms got into it on the seventh day, only for the Sabbath. Okay, that is how the law provided it. So he made absolutely sure, because remember that uh, he told Moses if there's anything left over after the day, that will have worms in it. But the ones that he provided on the sixth day for the seventh day, the other half. Was n had, didn't add worms in it because the Lord made sure because they was not supposed to pick up manna they were supposed to just eat it they had to prepare it the previous day that is what the word says we have to do if the Lord himself found the need to rest after he created everything in six days who the hell do we think we are if we do not need to do it if he says that all Born again Christians should also do it. Who the hell do we think we are? Who, yes, and um, what are we, do we think we are better than the Lord, the creator of the universe? Think again before you disobey Sabbath day again. Are you pleasing the Lord or are you acting in pride and you are worshipping Satan and you are, you are glorifying Satan in that disobedience? Yeshua never took it away, never ever. Every Friday night when their Shabbat Shalom started, he and his parents, since he was born, and his brothers at first, they had it every Friday night. That is when they started it, with sundown. And he and his disciples carried on with it for three and a half years. And through his entire life, even after his resurrection, he was for, uh, for 50, around about 50 days still on the earth. Before his ascension, what did he do? He still had it with him every Friday night, even being Christians. Yeshua never 
took it away. Never ever. And Yeshua also became the Lord of the Sabbath. Matthew 12 verse 8, Mark 2 verse 27 and 28, and Luke 6 verse 5. You can read it all about it in there. On three places. And he gave no one permission to trespass it. The Lord is not taken for a fool. In Exodus 20 verse 8 to 10 you will see you will see that the Lord commanded them to hallow the Sabbath in the Ten Commandments and gave it to them as a law on the Mount Sinai which the Lord wrote on those tablets himself with his own hand even twice. And therefore those laws still stand today and whether you want to believe it or not he confirmed it once again in Psalm 119 verse 89 where he said, Thy word is seated in heaven forever, and no one can remove it. Whose laws are, those laws are written in heaven, just as it has been given to humanity through Moses. Okay, now what does it mean for the church today, for us Christians, that Sabbath? What should we do on those days? Have Shabbat? Yes, you don't have to. I mean the ceremony. But the thing what you should do is spending time with the Lord, yes. You should stay away from shops, not buying, not selling, not exchanging any money, no business. No one works for you on that day. Not your garden person, not your maid in your house. You do not even pay EFT accounts or do internet banking on that day. You have nothing to do with money. Okay, you don't get your gardener to work in your garden. You don't eat out with Uber at any or at any restaurant by going to the theater and paying to watch a concert on the Sabbath day is dishonoring the Sabbath and its sin. You have six days to do those things. The Lord asks one day only to spend time with Him for, and also for your body to rest. You do get exception when, which is acceptable like when your mom gets sick, sick or she gets a heart attack on a, on a Sabbath day and you need to rush her to the hospital and need to pay toll gates and arrange money with a medical aid, etc. That is emergencies. And Yeshua also said that. Yeshua gave that ex same example to David who was running from Saul and he asked the priest for bread on the Sabbath day because he hasn't eaten for days. That was an emergency. If the Lord didn't punish David for that or the priest. 1 Samuel 21 verse 6 says it as well as where Yeshua referred to it in Matthew 12 verse 3 and 4. If you do these things out of your own desire and your own will, it's not an emergency. You are sinning one of the, one of the sins of the death penalty. And today that means you'll give Satan right to put his bondage chains on you again. Bring curses over your life again. With other words, you give him permission to control your life. This is just one example of how easy you can fall back into sin again. And ignorance is not an excuse for sinning after deliverance. You have to watch every seventh day that you obey the Lord's commandments, which occurs approximately 52 times a year. So you, your Sabbath you should have every seventh day. doesn't matter which day it is, as long as it's every seventh day. If you keep on dis by, uh, disobeying these dangerous sins, in Matthew 12.45 applies to you. And your love will be seven times worse than ever before. And when you need to go for deliverance again. But the Lord also warns us clearly in Hebrews 10, verse 26 and 20 to 29, that you sure cannot die again to atone for your sins. When you applied too far with His grace, there is no grace anymore. And you are only destined for the lake of fire. And the confession of sin won't help anymore if you reach that point. Don't get to that point. On the other hand, the grace of the Lord is vast as the universe and the heavens. But there can come a time that you will run, it will run out due to your continually sinning, willingly sinning after you knew what the truth is. And you received the full true gospel. Stay away from sins. Yeshua is always there for confession of sins. If you did something like that, you go and confess it to Him. He's always grace. But stop, keep on sinning. 
Stay away from that sin. I say again, you cannot please the Lord with sin. If you sin, you are a slave of sin. John 8, 34. And who is sin? Satan is sin. Full stop. It is the sin of pride. As pride started already and was instituted by Satan in the throne room long before the earth was created, where the Lord threw him out, pride is hidden in all kinds of sin. There is not one sin that is not underwritten in pride. Just a stern warning again. All sexual sins, including homosexuality, raping innocent people, or living together without being married, etc., is also under these sins of the death penalty. These sins do not get dealt with very well. If you do, yeah, these sins get dealt very well and thoroughly in the 200 meter. Before you move out of the 200, before you go to the 300 meter, you will know all about these kind of sins. The same goes for this. Do not go back in any of these sins ever again. There is no excuse for sinning. You can do all things through the Messiah that strengthens you. Philippians 4.13 That is it. You turn or you burn. Okay, the second kind of sin is also in the Old Testament. Um, I call it the temple sins. Those are the ones with the stone sins. This is the temple sins. Sins that are not for the death penalty, but normal sins, which gives you more grace. Okay. For other normal day-to-day sins that we as humans do, because we are weak and vulnerable, like swearing, lying, gossiping, tattooing, uh, speaking negatively, making mistakes, uh, you know, like what you're in your speech or whatever, um, and these sins are not for the death penalty. So in the, in the Old Testament, they didn't kill you for committing these ones. That's why the temple was there, or the tabernacle was there. There was the temple offerings that they could bring doves, lambs, or animals, uh, meat offerings, fruit, wheat, uh, anything like that to the temple uh, that the Lord approved of to do atonement for different sins, which was a sin offering, a peace offering, a trespass offering, or wave offering, etc. There was different levels of offerings and sins. Uh, Okay. For each one of these sins, there were also heavier or lighter offerings that they could bring. In some cases, two doves were not good enough to atone for some sins. Um, then the blood of the lamb was more suitable for that sin. Uh, okay. I'm not exactly sure which went for what, but it's all in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus. You will read all about it. Okay. Uh, today we do not need a sheep farm to catch a few doves or to catch a few doves and offer it on our bri or barbecue. Yeshua became the lamb that was slaughtered by the high priest. And you'll read about it in Matthew 26, verse 65 and 66. That is when they, the high priest said he must be crucified. That is exactly the same that was prophesied in action in Exodus 29, 11. You will see that that is where the prophecy was fulfilled. Uh, from Exodus 29 was fulfilled in Matthew 26. Okay, we only need to go on our knees and confess and ask the Father in the name of Yeshua for forgiveness daily and turn away from it. If you neglect doing confession of sin daily before the Father in heaven, this can turn into sins that are for the death penalty. For example, if you battle in the areas of anger before your deliverance, say, for example, you are hitting your wife, you get this anger attacks, and you battle with temptation, then you pour out your heart before him, talk to him, tell him immediately you have sinned. He gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Okay? Uh, there's always grace, but also the, you have to use the grace correctly. The Lord will never turn anyone away who comes to him. As David had said in Psalm uh, 51 verse 17 I quote from the old King James Bible which is the same as the Hebrew it just makes it's just easier to read it the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart a God O oh God thou will not despise the Hebrew word for not despise is lo tivze which means never reject or cast away under any circumstance the temple offerings were not good enough for the stone sins. Only the temple sins. Okay, if you 
this holy, the Sabbath day, there was no grace. The temple sins was not good enough. The temple confession, bringing 50 lambs, wouldn't help. It's not good enough. The Lord, you had to be killed. The Lord ordered the people to be killed. By, okay, but by the blood of Yeshua, all the stone and all the temple sins are redeemable. Besides one, which I will discuss later. Okay, so all of them, all sins today, whether it's the temple sins and whether it's the, is all redeemable. But for the, for, for the stone sins, Satan gets part, gets, gets right into your soul. You have to go for deliverance for that. That's why you can't go back into those sins again. We all make mistakes. I mean, we swear sometimes. Uh, we do this sometimes. Even if you go, if you had a tattoo before your deliverance, it always will be there. You confess the sin, but just don't go again and put another tattoo on, because then you're going to have to confess it again. But it will not. It's, it's a kind of sin that's not going to uh, bring uh, Satan can well attack you, but he won't have. It's, it's, he doesn't. It's not one of those sins that will give him right into your soul. Okay, I even confess sins every day. Also, what I do, sorry, let me just start again. Uh, I confess unknown sins as well. It's important that you do confess. Ask the Lord every day to forgive you for unknown sins, and you must make these unknown sins known to you. It's very important because that's what saved my life many times. Okay, that you, because you can commit it, and, and then, but when the Lord brings it to your attention, then it's not an unknown sin anymore. Then it's, so it depends on what it is. So it can be, it, but it can get you into trouble if you still ignore it and you think it's a stone, you, you think it's a, um, it's an unknown sin, which is not. Okay, so as soon as you know about something, it's not unknown anymore. Okay, but then you ask the Lord, right, but if you ask the Lord to forgive you for the unknown sins, He will not hold it against you if you don't know about it. According to John 15:22, but ignorance is no excuse. If you ask him to show you, he will show you. And then it's not an unknown sin anymore. And then I cannot say, or you cannot say, I didn't know. You'll be found guilty of sinning, even if it's a temple sin, and you give Satan throne room rights to attack you, or turn chains around your feet again, which can lead to stone sins if you do not deal with it. He has an example. I'm going to give an example to explain what I say there. Okay. This can happen in this way. This is just an example to give you an idea how how you can how this thing can bring, bring you into trouble. Say, for example, I spend more time with my Persian cat than with the Lord, and the cat becomes more important to me than the Lord. The Holy Spirit brings this unknown sin under my attention that I need to repent of, and then it becomes a normal sin, a temple sin. He will tell you, listen, uh, your cat is more important to me, and then you will realize it, and you are going to confess it, and you will work on it, and make sure you, you, that kind of thing, and make sure your cat doesn't become more important than Lord. But now I ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit and continue doing. Spend more and more time with my cat. Later it gets, I get another cat. I get obsession about a cat. And then I get another cat. Eventually I have a whole cat kennel in my home. And then in a few months' time, I have a whole cat choir sing on the feline show on DSTV. For this production, I had to put in a lot of money and a lot of time. So where is my time with the Lord going? Nowhere. This is an idol of obsession, and then it moves my attention away from the Lord further and further. I become obsessed with cats, and I start moving into the stone sins of the death penalty by worshipping idols, which is written in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 3. It's basically become an obsession, and then Satan turns chains around my feet again and again, and I slip back, and Satan has me in, my, in his way before I realize it. And by that time I realize it, it's too late. And then when I need to go for deliverance again, to become free. Or if I still persist and the spirit that was in me previously come back seven times worse than himself. And first it starts as an unknown sin, but when the Lord tells you about it, it's no excuse to be unknown anymore. When you deliberately keep on sinning and you can move from a temple sin to a stone sin. There are a few fundamental changes that you need to make the day after your deliverance. 
because you are not in heaven yet. And the devil is all around us in the spiritual realm. You are not free from him yet. I mean, he is there, but he doesn't have to be part of you. He's still in the spiritual realm. You can't see him. Especially now, it's the time that you need to be on the watch out. Be awake because your enemy is like a roaring lion, seeking out who he can devour and pull you back into his kingdom. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Right, now I come at the last sin, the third one. The third kind of sin, I call it the death sin. The death, the sin of the death. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. According to the word of the Lord in Matthew 12, 31, 32, all sins are forgivable. Besides, if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, which is not forgivable, and there is no grace for this one, especially after you have been through deliverance, you stay away from this one. Yeshua spoke these words himself, and he knows what he's talking about. Do not gamble with your place in heaven. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father. He is holy, just as the Father is. He is also in the presence of the Father on earth. We do not deserve the Holy Spirit at all, but Yeshua gave him for us free. And that is the only hotline that we have in the throne room. To make sure, so make sure you look after this free gift. The Father can withdraw him any time he wants. And when you are, then you are just as good as a heathen and a Satan worshipper. The presence of the Holy Spirit in my life is the most valuable gift that anybody could give me. And I make sure I look after it with my life. Because without the voice of the Holy Spirit, I'm nothing, dead, just a piece of dry bones. And dry bones and flesh without breath, like Ezekiel 37 speaks about. I'm not talking about when you grieve the Holy Spirit. We all grieve Him. I'm talking about blaspheming again. Alright? Really blaspheme. Like for example... The Jews, three times a day in the synagogue, they blaspheme Yeshua. They blaspheme the Holy Spirit. That is what I'm talking about. But for, for them, it's a different story. Okay? But I'm just giving an example what the difference is between blaspheming and grieving. Okay? Grieving is forgivable. I mean, I grieve him a lot too. But the thing is, because we're not perfect. That's why forgiveness of sin is important. But it's when you curse him. You curse the Holy Spirit. That's what Yeshua was talking about. And read it there. It's, it's very clear in any, any translation of the Bible. Okay. Therefore, any sin I do, no matter how, how big, how small, is born out of pride. Stay away from it. Okay. This is the end of part one. Shalom. Shalom, previously in part 1, in the 400 meter, in point 1, I discussed the importance of regular com confession of sin and warfare. Point 2, I discussed the three different kinds of sin, the stone sins, the temple sins, and the death sins. Now we move on to point 3. Building a treasure, a treasure chest in your spirit. Another thing I had to learn... The extremely hard way was to build a treasure chest inside my spirit between me and the Lord. Only He knows and hears a conversation without anything coming out of your mouth. Satan or any of his goons cannot hear what you are saying if, he do, if it does not come out of your mouth. Only the Lord can see your mind and what's in your spirit. If you write down it on paper or even type anything on your PC or phone, the force of darkness can still see and hear it. The devil's goons understand all languages spoken on earth. It is not when you, it's only when you keep it in your spirit that they cannot see, hear, or read your mind. Number four, watch your speech and do not plan ahead. Do not plan ahead. Do not do any form of divination. Planning ahead is abomination to the Lord. For Jeremiah twenty nine eleven says in Hebrew. For I myself know the designs, the plans that I am designing for you. Declares the Lord, designs for your inner peace and not for evil, and to give you a year after the expectation of for your life. Proverbs 18.21 says, Life and death is in the power of the tongue, 
and they that love nurture it shall eat the fruit thereof. Ask the Lord, like David asked in Psalm 141 verse 3, Please, O Lord, do set an armed soldier, armed watch, right in front of my mouth, a guardian and protector against myself at the doors of my lips. Also in Psalm 34 verse 13, Preserve your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. The Hebrew word murmur is translated as deceit, but it has a deeper and most vast meaning. It means to keep my tongue from speaking evil and my lips from speaking lies, dishonesty, deception, fraud and cursing yourself and others, vain babblings. Refrain from these things completely after your deliverance. It opens doors to Satan and pull you back into the world and also it can bring you into big trouble. As these days everyone takes everyone to court just by something they said in public. Put duct tape on your mouth or bandages around your fingers so that you cannot type if you have to. Especially with the social media platforms. If you have a Facebook page, please check with the Holy Spirit before you post everything on there. And that goes for another chat platforms like WhatsApp and Telegram. The key to live as a true Christian is this. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talking, but a matter of power only. 1 Corinthians 4.20 Always remember it. Never forget it. The Greek also says in 2 Timothy 2.16 Refrain from all profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. And your tongue can set alight a fire in hell. James 3 verse 6 If the Lord speaks to you about anything concerning you or your ministry, in the future, keep it in your spirit. There is far too much evil goons of Satan in the spiritual realm with excessively big ears. Many people battle with this one. Even I myself used to be very guilty of this one. And I still have not mastered this skill completely yet. But practice makes perfect. And the Lord gives a lot of grace when you ask forgiveness and stand up again. Number five, the voice of the Holy Spirit. You get all your orders and tasks from the Holy Spirit alone. You do not say anything that the Holy Spirit does not order you to say or do. All the decisions you made, you have to learn to know the Holy Spirit in everything. You do not do anything the Holy Spirit does not give you permission for. Even if it's getting involved in the things at your local church or community, if he says, no, you cannot do this or that, you stay away from it. For the day of your de- from the day of your deliverance, you only listen to the Holy Spirit alone and no one else. Remember, all personal conversations between you and the Lord must be in your spirit as far as possible, so that the devil and his good do not hear it. It confuses them big time if you are quiet with your mouth. And it frustrates them if they do not know what's going on in your heart. Once you babble it out of your mouth, they all hear it. And then Satan launches attacks against you by your own words you speak. The devil and his goons are far more awake than what we are. Therefore, we must be sharp and quick as serpents and harmless and innocent as doves. Because we get sent as sheep among the wolves as Yeshua warned us in Matthew 10 verse 16. Okay, the Lord's will, number six. There are three types. Okay, let's take a scenario. If the Lord says to you, wash your car in your yard with a hose pipe yourself. Okay, this is just an example. Number one, the perfect will of the Lord. You do exactly as you ask, even if you do not feel up to it, you wash your car yourself in your yard with your own hose pipe. You do not ask your son, your daughter, to do it. You do it yourself. Yeshua demonstrated this as a perfect example of the Lord's perfect will by going to the cross. That is what you should do every time. This is what the Lord wants you to do, is to stay in His perfect will. But there's other two that you can also choose which is not entirely from Him. Okay, the other one, the second one is the Lord's acceptable will. You do not feel like it, and you take your car to the petrol garage, washing bay, where someone else washes it, and they break your one rearview mirror, mirror by accident, 
which you must repay at your own cost. You cannot be angry with the garage or the person who washed your car. You can be only angry with yourself. The car is washed, but not by the correct person or on the right place. This is only partially doing his will. Just like King Saul, and look what happened to him and his entire family over time, if you are in his acceptable will. Okay, the third one, the desert road where you'll be given over to Satan. If you ignore the Lord's command completely, and due to disobedience, he will give you over to Satan, so that he will bring you to your knees. You do not wash your car at all. The windows are dirty, and you cannot see through it properly. And if you make an accident, your car has huge damage, and you are hospitalized. And it's costing a lot of money, you might not have a medical aid. This is what happened to the Israelites when they continued in disobedience and they were led into exile and was given over to Satan to bring them on their knees for seven long years. Okay, it's always the best to seek the Lord's perfect will in all you do, nothing else. This is your choice within which of the three roads you can take. The Bible has many examples of what happens to people in these three areas. Okay, number four, number seven. Right, there are four worst enemies that you're going to have. Four of them. I will discuss each one of them. The first one is the own self, the pride enemy. The Lord does not expect us to be perfect. I've fallen many times, especially with the process of sanctification of the own self. That is one thing you will need to deal with. The own self is a worse enemy than Satan. But if the own self is not under control of Yeshua, then Satan will use it for his benefit and destroy you even further. The Lord is not pleased with the own self at all, and he will start dealing with you as soon after your deliverance. The own self is something you need to lay down every day of your life. It does not go away as long as you have breath in your lungs. You will have to deal with the own self. You need to teach it to bow down to the will of the Father alone. And this is sometimes extremely painful for the own self. Yeshua himself gave us the best example of that in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he had to bow his own will to the will of the Father. Okay, number, the second one of that, number B. Satan and his evil goons. That's your second enemy. Okay, Satan is our enemy and we need to know who our enemy is. We must know that what his strategy is, he is real, we cannot see him, but he's there. We need to know who our enemy is and how he operates. In the book of Job, chapter 1 and 2, you will see that Satan goes into the throne room, laying charges of sins against you and me every day. And he asks rights to attack us, due to the, our disobedience to the word or the Lord's orders. The devil knows the Bible better than we do, and he blinds us and uses a strategy against us. The Long Sin Confession letter teaches you what this is and how to deal with it. You cannot afford not to do regular confession of sin. You, I, have, I have learned this, that is the best to do confession of sins at least every 24 to 48 hours. Because sin adds up and it gives Satan right in the throne room. Psalm 50 verse 6 says, um, this is only one of many scriptures that says that the Father in heaven is righteous. He judges righteously. The Lord does not have any favorites. Especially when you have been delivered from Satan's chains and strongholds, you are now a threat to Satan and he hates the light of Yeshua and you and he will try everything, even use people to get you back at your old ways into his kingdom. Whatever you are, wherever you are in full-time ministry or you're just a normal Christian working for the salary or are a pensioner or a business owner, you are still a threat to Satan and he wants to pull you back. You have to look at our faith spiritually and the Holy Spirit will help you with this if you ask him. C. Flesh and blood, other people. That's the third enemy. Also remember that your fight is not against people, but the spirits of darkness in them according to Ephesians 6 verse 12. 
Anyone that did not receive deliverance and do not live in obedience of the word or under the control of Satan, and the only way you can fight is by using 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 to 5, and do not take people on personally, especially not on social media. That is the place you stay away from when you are angry with someone. It is not them, it is the sin, the darkness and Satan in them which they are not aware of. You will find that in your family. I get that in my family all the time. They don't understand what you're saying. They are blinded by Satan. They've got chains. And they don't realize because Satan is lying to them. So if you are talking to Satan. You cannot talk to them. You cannot change them. You must rather be quiet. You must go and swing the sword. But the problem is if you're talking to them, you are talking to Satan. I know it's very frustrating for me. It's extremely frustrating. If people continue, continue, and continually spit they they just spit on you all the whole time. All the time. And you have to keep quiet. Because you know where it comes from. It's not easy if you're all alone in a family that is not serving the Lord. It, it, and even if they do, they are totally, totally blinded. If you are not sold out for Yeshua Mashiach and under the full control of the Holy Spirit, you are under the control of sin, and sin is Satan himself. Therefore you cannot hold grudges against any person, whether it's a he or she or black or white or colored, Indian, Chinese or Israeli. It is not their, uh, their skin color and their culture that's the problem. It is what is living in them and controlling them. And that is nothing, none other than Satan himself. The problem is that you cannot see it with your naked eye. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal the spirit in the spiritual realm to you. It will not help fighting the person. See for what it is and do not fear it. Ignore and move on. All you can do is to do what you sure did. Wash their feet, show love and kindness, help where you can. And do as the Holy Spirit orders you to do. Believe me, it is not easy. It is not easy to do this. Even if it's your own family, your own mother can turn against you and see you out as an as a, as, as a enemy or as something from Satan because I've been there. I know that. I get that all the time. They don't understand when you've gone through deliverance. They don't understand anything. They will accuse you from things. I mean, it is absolutely with time you learn you can see the dist you can distinct distinguish between if it's them speaking or when it's Satan speaking. The Lord created all people on earth, no matter what color their skin is, their culture, their language, and what they speak or where are they from, where they are from. Satan cannot create people. Only God can create humans. Humans cannot create humans. The universe cannot create humans either. So people that believe that we are created by the universe is a lie out of the pit of hell. You cannot expect the Lord to forgive your sins if you cannot forgive other people. Whether they are black, white, colored, Indian, Israeli, Chinese, Japanese, whatever nationality. According to Matthew 12, verse 30 and 31. Okay, the last one of this of who's your enemy is persecution, trials and tribulation. When people attack you, it's not ne necessarily something you're doing wrong. It is the light of the Holy Spirit in you, blinding the forces of darkness in other people that have not been through deliverance yet. On earth there are two kingdoms fighting each other. And that is the darkness of Satan and the light, and the light of Yeshua. Satan is spirit. And he can only operate in a body. And he can attack you through people who love you the most. Those ones who are the closest to you. Like your husband, your wife, your child, your parents, your boss, your colleagues, and even your cat or your dog or your parrot. Please note, you will be persecuted more by people after your deliverance than ever before. Even people... That, do not, that you do not know will walk up to you and swear at you for no reason. Believe me, I've, I've had this time and again. That people in the church, they just walk up to you and they just start swearing at you. It is just unbelievable what you get. 
This is not them. And it's very difficult to see this. But you have to trust the Holy Spirit. This is Satan persecuting you through people. He's wanting to stop you to follow the true gospel of Yeshua Mashiach. He's not after you. He's after Yeshua in you. I quote from the Old King James Bible. Paul made it noticeably clear in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 14. Being defamed, that means mocked, spitted on by the world, we are accused as a filthiness of the world, the scum of all things worse than before. That's directly from the Greek. Yeshua also said the following in Matthew 10, 21. You shall be hated by all because of my name, yet he who endures to the very end shall be saved. The good news in 1 Peter 1 verse 6 and 7 verse 6 says, Wherein you gr greatly rejoice, that only for a season, if need be, you are in the heavens through the manifold of temptations, that the trial of your faith be more precious than gold that perishes, though it's been tried by fire and might be found into the praise and honor and the glory that, at the appearing of Jesus Christ. All the retribution, judgment and wrath belongs to the Lord only. Deuteronomy 32 verse 35 And the Greek Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 12 We have not been given any orders to wrestle with flesh and blood. Or people are uh, created with flesh, flesh and blood. People, that's normally people. Most of the time. But with the original unseen, but we are with the original unseen sovereignties, the authorities with the system holders and the world might of this dark, this worldly darkness, with the spiritual and mighty forces of wickedness among the wicked armed forces of the hierarchy of the satanic invisible army. That is directly from the Greek, that one. Understanding exactly what Paul had in mind when he said that. Remember this, if people attack you, ask yourself this one question. Have this person had deliverance, yes or no? If no, you do not need to look any further and feed it. Sometimes it's difficult. I've been falling into this many times. And that will give you the reason that Satan uses innocent people to do his dirty work. And he blinds them as well. And they cannot see what they are doing. They don't know what they're doing. It's the best is to pray and ask Yeshua, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. That is what Yeshua said on the cross before he died. Ignore them because it is Satan speaking to you through them. Do not feed it. Do not answer him. I was also there before my deliverance. Satan had me in his chains and did the same with me. That is why I get persecuted so badly. Now after my deliverance for 16 months and non-stop. Because he has no hold over me anymore. The light of Yeshua hurts his eyes because he, his light drives away darkness. When it's dark in your room at night and you light up a candle or, a, or switch on the light or a torch or something, it lightens up your whole room. Now that is what the light of Yeshua in you are doing to the dark and evil forces of Satan in the spiritual realm. They cannot operate in the light only in darkness. Okay, number nine, we finish with those four things. Those are the four enemies that you will have. Okay, mostly it is yourself, people, and Satan. Okay, uh, do not lend out your ears to other people. Number nine, if you listen to what your priest, your reverend, your pastor, or any other preacher on YouTube says, and it's not 100% according to the Bible itself, do not listen to them, because if you do, the curses will start coming back and the Lord has warned us about that in Jeremiah 17 verse 5 and 6. Verse 5. That a curse will rest upon you if you trust in people and make them your arm to lean on and not the Lord. And, and then uh, verse 6. You will be like a dry heath in the, in the desert. You shall not distinguish between fru a fruitful land and a salty land that cannot be inhabited. And Isaiah 2 verse 22 says, Cease ye from man, as his, as his breath is only in his nostrils, wherein can he be accounted for? People can't help you. Okay, the true Bible and the Holy Spirit is all you need in your walk with the Lord. You shall not live of bread alone. 
but from every word spoken and it comes out of the mouth of the Lord himself. Deuteronomy 8 verse 3 and Yeshua, Yeshua also said it to Satan in Matthew 4 verse 4. Finally, on this point of your enemies, is people is that people will try and force you to fit into their frame of reference. They will try and change you. Do not listen to them. Even if they come upon you like a swarm of bees, use Psalm 3 to fight this enemy and go to the Lord and put your trust in the Lord like David did when Absalom chased him, when he ran from his own son who wanted to kill him. Do not run away, but stand firm with your weapons of your warfare in Yeshua and do not get despondent. If you fear the name of the Lord and the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. Isaiah 59.19 You need to stand on the, on the word of the Lord. You must also refrain from doing the same to others. Do not try and change people because you will break your head and you will bash your head against a brick wall. People will never change unless the Lord changes them. Do not try and make them to do what you, what you want them to do. Do not expect anything from people. People are the greatest disappointment to you will ever face on, the, face on the face of the earth. Rather pray for your enemies instead of judging and cursing them for not being on the same level as you are. If you grow spiritually advanced, be careful not to expect others to be on your level. I had to learn this the hard way. I had to learn that I... That I got in this place where I am now because of the Lord himself and because he is the one that got me hungry for his word. Not anyone else. And not everybody is on the same level of spirituality. Some are more advanced, some less. You get Christians that have been Christian for, for donkey years, 30 years, and they are still on milk. But then you get Christians that is Christians for a year and then they're already on solid meat. See, it all depends on how many times they spend with the Lord, how hungry they are for the Lord, etc., etc. And also how much they get intimidated by other people also. If other Christians are not there where you are, leave them, let the Lord deal with them. Each person has to walk his own road and work out his own salvation. All we can do is to pray for them, love them, support them where possible. And leave the rest to the Lord. I know it's not easy to do this. Believe me, the own self always gets in the way of this. Because you always want to have the last say. Believe me, I know and I still had to deal with this. I still had to work hard on this, on this point. But you, we're all going to have to do it as long as we live. I cannot control other people's lives. Just as others cannot control mine. Even if you are alone following the Lord's orders for your life, so be it. Continue doing it and do not worry about others and what they may think of you. Even if they think you are the scum of the earth, let them think, let them think so. Because you cannot change the way they think about you. You can't force people to like you. But only focus on what the Lord thinks of you. And you know what the truth is and hold on to the truth rather than the lies of Satan and out of people's mouth towards you. I had to learn to stop torturing myself because of what other people think of me according to their own frame of mind and also according to Satan speaking through them. I have to learn not to accept anything from people at all. They will for sure disappoint you very badly. Once you can overcome this, you will be able to live in the complete peace, shalom of Yeshua, because you cannot carry other people's crosses for them, only your own. Okay, right, and point number 10 is where, uh, this is where I said earlier on that this is where the Lord sh spoke to me directly on this after my deliverance. This is not one of the points that Cook had in his 400 meters, but this form part of the next one that he's talking about. Okay, uh, I call it from Moses' tabernacle to the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is not, okay, so this is basically... My own experience um, and uh, my own studies that I did from, of the, from, of, from the Hebrew Bible and right, pulling it right to the Greek Bible. Okay, first there was the tabernacle of Moses, then the first temple of Solomon, and then the second one again, and which was rebuilt 
by the Persians and then expanded by King Herod and now we have moved over to the, to the temple of the Holy Spirit according to 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 and 20 which is in our bodies. Okay, you need to understand how exactly the tabernacle of Moses was designed and worked and where the priests and the Levites fit in and how they were sanctified with all its furniture in it plus the materials which was the Lord's property alone before you ever understand what the temple of the Holy Spirit is. No one should touch any of the Lord's property in that tabernacle and the as well as the temple, besides the priests and the Levites, who was anointed by the Lord Himself, and especially not unclean people from outside Israel. If you see how the high priest was inaugurated into service in Exodus 29, that whole chapter, you will understand the whole Gospel of Yeshua in the New Testament, and you will understand how important confession of sin is to the Lord. Just look at what the Torah teaches you about the temple. And even in the other prophet books, you'll see it there in uh, Chronicles, and you'll see it in the books of Kings, and you'll see it in the books of Samuel, and Jeremiah, and, everybody, and all those big prophets. And how he hates sins, and all he wants is holiness, sanctification, and you treat him with absolute respect. And you'll see in the entire Old Testament the love and the care he had for his people, his ongoing patience towards them. Look past all the gruesome blood and sin offerings and then you will really see the big picture of what the Father's heart of God really is. I, I, I met this face to face first time when I worked through the Torah. When I landed up at the end of Deuteronomy, I could really see this happening. The Father heart of God. I could see it for the first time but also I read it in a combination with the Hebrew Bible and the King James Bible. How he loves you and me and the blood of the Lamb is the only way to the throne room. And how we tolerated these Israelites for years and years. But still he kept his promise and sent the promised Messiah who made the table equal and flat for each person, each tribe, each culture, each tongue, black, white, colored people and all the nations of the earth, his own creation. King Solomon built him a house. But he does not live in temples made by hands. And heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. Acts 7, 7 to 49. He lives in me and you, in our bodies. Once you are born again and receive the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit and his pure word. That is the only guide and compass for your life further. Okay, let us continue with Kut's 400 meter pulse. Right, the next one is number 11, unlawful use of Yeshua's blood, body and blood. Right, now this is a shocker for many people. I also had to face this. Once you have been delivered, you always first do the long confession of sin before you touch the wine and the bread or taking communion. Even since, ever since I've been through deliverance, I've never taken communion at any church or with anyone at all. If you want to share in communion with other believers, make sure you do proper you do it the proper way firstly and secondly that people that those people have received proper deliverance and understand the whole principle of sin and sin of and confession of sin. Be incredibly careful with whom you take communion. If you wish to take communion you first ask the Holy Spirit for permission. He knows if you are ready to take it or not. Because it can have devastated consequences if you take it in an unworthy manner. Read what Paul says about it in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 27 to 23. Uh, sorry, 27 to 32. He explains it beautifully. That you can read that in any translation. The King James explained it to me very well there. And I could understand it very clearly, even in the King James Bible. Do not just take it because anybody else is doing it or because your church is doing it. Sunday you're having communion or whenever you have your Sabbath day. Don't take it because they're giving it. The Holy Spirit is the one that's in control. After your deliverance, you must be absolutely careful with the blood and the body of Yeshua. It is His blood, His body and you will not play with it. Rather leave it if you're not sure. 
In my case, I'm ordered by the Holy Spirit to do the Messianic Shabbat Shalom every Sabbath day in South Africa on my own. And communion is the center of Shabbat Shalom. You can ask them. Even the Jews will tell you that. If I'm not ready, or I'm not sure if I must do communion this, pati- this particular Sabbath day, maybe because the Lord is dealing with sins of pride or something in my life, uh, then I'd rather leave the communion and do Shabbat Shalom without it or don't do Shabbat at all. The Lord has understanding for this. It's better not to do it if you're not ready. I do the Shabbat Shalom itself in Hebrew. Every time before I do Shabbat, I do the long sin confession and the new warfare always, always. Without that, I do not touch Yeshua's body and blood at all. This is a standing order to me unless he tells me otherwise for some reason like I mentioned just now. Since I have learned Hebrew and understand the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, it's in its original language, I saw so many things that got lost along the way with, by the translation. That is why I took the road to understand how it was really said first hand. And I only read the Hebrew and the Greek Bible. I do not make use of... I also make use of the Old King James Bible to assist me along the way with the language barrier. Because we start learning Hebrew, it's not that easy to understand it in the beginning. I'm still learning every day. I'm not perfect with that yet, but I'm still learning. And the Holy Spirit is very, very faithful. Number 12. Chastisement of the Lord. Take time with the word of the Lord and spending proper time with Him. That is the only key to success. You must be able to receive and accept true hard discipline and chastisement from the Lord. And do not despise it. It is your, for your own benefit. It is really painful at times. But it heals a peaceable harvest of His true holiness for those who are exercised by it. You can go and read about that in Hebrews 12 verse 11 and 12. Proverbs 3 verse 11 and 12 as well. Because... We have an enemy out there and he wants to kill you. He wants to steal from you and he wants to destroy you. But Yeshua came to give you life and life in abundance. John 10 verse 10. And Yeshua chastises those he loves. Revelation 3.19 for that reason. Okay, number 13. Worship the Father in music, song, dance. The best way you can ever worship the Father is by complete obedience to his word or orders he gives you. Nothing more, there is nothing else that can please him more than complete obedience. And you also need to confess, confess it with your mouth, uh, to worship him through that, through Psalms or whatever. Okay, but the Lord also commanded us in the last few chapters in the book of Psalms that we must also worship him with dance, song, and instruments. Miriam, Moses' sister, and the woman did so with the tambourines and dance when they came out of Egypt. Exodus 15 verse 20 and 21. The Father loves musical worship towards Him, especially His own words from the Word. Due to the covered locking, I have learned to make use of YouTube and I make use of song and dance with flags in my worship most mornings, mostly the Hebrew and Messianic worship, uh, which also helps me with the practicing and the pronunciation of Hebrew and to remember those long difficult words at least as at least 90% of these songs were directly written out of the Hebrew Bible. And not a lot of, um, and a lot of these songs they took from the Greek New Testament and translated it directly into Hebrew. Or they took the Hebrew translation. Or they write songs from the Old Testament that was prophesied about the Messiah, like verses from the Torah, Isaiah and Psalms. Um, I, I really enjoy worshipping the Father in, in his own language, in the, in the modern music. Uh, I used to play the piano as well. Uh, so I am a worshipper as well, and that is important to me. For me, Hebrew worship changed my whole worship life in the throne room, but there are wonderful English songs available on YouTube. One of them I can recommend is Paul Wilbur, Matt Redman, and Michael W. Smith. Okay, now then... The next point is areas of struggle. Right, we all struggle. Some people will struggle more in certain areas than others. This is where you need to work extremely hard on these weaknesses and be patient with yourself. Other Christians who did not have these problems before must also learn to be patient and do not judge people like those and vice versa. For me as a virgin, still on the age of 55, 
I will not understand what people are going through with pornography, fornication issues, because I've never been there. But for me, who had severe food obsession, obesity severing, food intolerances and allergies, my entire life had almost killed me a few times. People who did not have that will also not understand what I'm struggling with and could judge me out of their own paradigm. Therefore, I choose not to judge people with sexual sin issues because I don't know anything about it. And only the Lord can help them with that. But I pray for people like that and ask the Lord to intervene and give these people His wisdom on how to deal with this problem. Just like I do with my own problems. Some people had a much harder life than others, but when we get deliverance, they, then we will have to start working on things like our own self, which is underwritten by pride, and other areas where our weakness is. People who are not suffering with these kind of problems can easily judge you and expect you to get victory over it in no time. Christians must learn to respect each other's viewpoints and weak points and do not judge them or hammer on them all the time. You need to give yourself space and bring it before the Lord every day. No one out of there knows what you are struggling with. This is something between you and the Lord. The Lord himself said in Deuteronomy 32 verse 35 that the punishment, the judgment, the retribution belongs to him alone and not to any of us. We have, we have no right to judge other people and other Christians, especially in their weaknesses, because uh, we also have weaknesses even after, even after deliverance. It is important to try and work on it daily and ask the Lord to help you if you are battling, even if it looks like you are not getting victory, keep on persisting. One day your victory will come. When I look back over the past 16 months, I could see many hard battled victory over many things that I struggled with. Persistence pays off. Do not do what other Christians expect from you. Like to share the word with others, to try and make more disciples or even to evangelize and go back and get involved in your church, etc., etc. Sometimes the Lord wants to keep you set apart for Him in isolation for a certain time, especially in the first year or two to build you up in His Word, um, and you're not ready for the world outside yet. He does things differently with each person. In Israel today, if a Gentile or a Jew becomes a Christian, they get taken out of society in a way, and he or she goes for a two-year course in the original Old Testament and the, and, the, and the New Testament translated in Hebrew. Okay, uh, they don't use the Greek Bible there. Okay, to build the foundation of the true Christianity in the original text, especially in the Old Testament. There are a few ministries in Jerusalem that does these courses live and online as well. Most of the Israelis speak Hebrew, for if they do, yeah, and if they do not, they must learn it in order to understand the Hebrew Bible. When they finish this period, then they only are ready for the Lord can use them anywhere in the world where He wants to. He, then He can do anything with that person. We have to go through a time of purification and to get the purity of the whole Bible in our spirits. This is the standard for all new born again Christians in Israel. These Christians have been known as solid born again Christians and know the word very well and they are ready for the battlefield. A new soldier does go, does go for basic training for at least six months. I'm talking now about the army and the air force now. Before the air force and the army can send them out into the battlefield. They make sure that they are ready before they can send them to war. There are many times and seasons that is determined by the Lord only. And for every purpose under heaven there is a season. Acts 1 verse 7 and Ecclesiastes 6, 3 verse 1. Do not compare yourself with others that are longer in the Christian road than what you are. You need to persist in what the Lord wants you to do, even if you stand alone. The Lord walks a journey with each person individually. You will fall, you will make mistakes, but it's okay. Yeshua has unlimited grace and will always pick you up. If you fall ten times a day, stand up again. Do not allow other people to condemn you for it. Their breath is only in their nostrils. Isaiah 2 verse 22 Thomas Edison had a thousand attempts to make a light bulb work. He kept on trying and trying until it finally worked. Today, thanks to his persistence of a thousand efforts, 
We have electrical lights today all over the world. Do not give up. Try again every time. Paul said in Romans 8.37 In all these things we are more than conquerors. Someday your victory will come. Keep on persisting and do not let people push you and put pressure on you to perform and to be perfect. And that people includes you as well, you personally. Don't be too hard on yourself. Do everything step by step with the Lord in your own space. Someone once says, tough times make you tougher. Paul says in Romans 5 verse 34 from the King James, Not only so, but glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience brings hope. The Holy Spirit can lead you anywhere after your deliverance. He can send you back to your church and your job. He can take you out of your church and lead you somewhere else to prepare you for something. He can put you in a new season with Him. And His season will always entail spending time with your Heavenly Father and also to get to know Him personally. If you, want, if you wait on the Lord, He will give you guidance. Even if it sounds funny or weird, make sure it's from Him and walk in the footpath he has prepared for you. We are living in the end times and now is the time that you really need to make an effort to spend ample time with Him in His presence because you never know what will happen tomorrow. He has it all in His hand. Always be ready as if He's coming back today or you will die today. Make sure you are like those wise virgins and make sure your lamps are always full of oil. Matthew 25 Okay, finally my conclusion Unfortunately, if you do not adhere to the word of the Lord 100%, you will land up on the broad road again that leads to destruction and many will find it. But once you have been through deliverance, you have to stay on the narrow road at all times in order to make it to heaven, as only a few will find it. As Yeshua said himself in Matthew 7 verse 13 and 14. You might not agree on everything I said here, but it's fine. That is just my own experience. A personal testimony uh, on how I built foundation of the peer word during the first 16 months after my deliverance. The deeper you dig into the word, the more the Holy Spirit breaks it open to you and open your eyes to things that you are blinded over the years. I would like to say that there were times in the past 16 months that I was sorry that I went for deliverance. I must admit it. But there was no turning back for me, especially since the Lord has called me full time for His work, being a small part of a big picture in bringing the Jewish nation to accept Yeshua as their promised Messiah also. The Lord had to deal extremely hard with pride in my life, and that's where the Lord used could as and a lot yes, and a which as part of his body to pull me through these terrible times in trying to, where I was trying to give up. It's just normal, it's natural, but I needed somebody like could to help me because without him I don't think I would have made it. But the Lord used him to assist me. Okay, the wonder of voice notes and telegram has really made a big difference. Uh, people is... Um, you know, pride, sorry not people, pride is terrible things in the eyes of the Lord. When you are called by the Lord, especially after deliverance, there is no turning back. You cannot look back. You have to move forward because there is no ro other road for you to walk. I would like to end this testimony to thank the Lord first and foremost for delivering me completely and utterly from all the chains of my bloodline curses over eight generations ever since I was born and sending good from stand up for Jesus on my road to help me with the deliverance as well as carrying me through the first six months after deliverance. Good was there for me all the time and I would like to thank him for his patience, his prayers, his support and especially his endurance by never ever giving up with me. That is what I would call a true Christian. That is what it's supposed to be. That is what Paul was trying to teach the church, the first church. Good was the only person that I could trust throughout this journey because he, ta he taught me all that the Holy Spirit taught him. And the Holy Spirit could take it further. As Good always says to me, you will get your answers only from the Holy Spirit and His Word. Yes, looking back over the past 16 months, I can really say this is the secret and the highlight of my walk with the Father. 
The secret lies by refraining from especially the stone sins, um, which was uh, made possible by a choice I made on the day of my deliverance. Another secret to success is to make sure you do confession of sin regularly, at least twice a week, but even better, every 24 to 48 hours. I give the Father of Moses, Abraham, Isaac and Israel all the glory and praise for his outstanding measures of grace and love for me, a wretch out of the gutters that he took and made something of my life, so that I will be good enough for him in trusting me as a small part of his plan to bring his own people, the Jews, to accept Yeshua as their own Messiah. I've met persecution face to face after my deliverance constantly, but it's worth doing deliverance because nothing on earth can compare with the intimacy with the Father that it gets added to your life after deliverance. But there is a price to pay, a huge price, the greatest price of all that was paid by Yeshua the Messiah himself more than 2,000 years ago. What can I lose? Nothing. What can I gain? An intimate relationship with the Heavenly Father and eternal life. The pain we are suffering is just temporary, but eternity is forever and ever, never ever stop. Dealing with your own self is a very painful situation, but it has to go. You cannot please the Lord with sin. You cannot please the Lord with your own self. It has to die. I was really battling very much dealing with the own self problem in my life and could have to reprimand me many times on the own self but I do not, but I, but I did seem to get victory over this thing slowly but surely. And I was battling and battling and until the Lord brought my life to a standstill and literally forced me to do a proper Bible study on the sin of pride so that I can understand where it originated and where it will end one day. And each person that ever lived on their first on this earth besides Yeshua was contaminated with pride. The Hebrew word for pride is Ramot, which is translated as exalt myself above the throne of God in the Hebrew context in this verse. In Isaiah 40, 14 verse 13 the Hebrew tells you what Satan really said. He actually said when he said that, I will exalt myself far above the stars, stars and the planets I mean, the stars and the planet is basically the universe, is how they saw it above heaven, and sit. On, and then he said he will exalt himself above that, and all the universe and everything in the universe above the throne, and sit on the throne, on my throne in heaven. I have completed the study in a six part Bible study over six sessions, which changed my whole life. Now, for the first time in my life, I really understand what their own self really means and I have a total new perspective out of the word of the Lord concerning the root of all sin which is pride once you can see that it makes a lot of sense and you will find it easier to, easier to let go of any pride and their own self in your life you also find that you get very lonely after your deliverance uh, a very few people will understand you, if any. I have found that I have been very lonely and even rejected, even more than what I was before my deliverance. I encountered problems with many Christians, especially if you understand the deepness of the spiritual world. The deeper you go into the Word, and the more you use the Word as your sword against the darkness out there, the more you will be hated and persecuted by your own family, church members, and even your pastor, your priest, and your reverend, they can also persecute you. Even if you have one person supporting you, it helps a lot. I only had Kut and his wife that support me in this difficult six months that I've been through. But at the end of the day, Yeshua, the Father and the Holy Spirit is always there for you. Therefore, it is so important to have a strong relationship in your spirit with the Holy Spirit. Our fight is not against people around you, but against the powers and principalities of Satan. Ephesians 6 verse 12 I want to encourage you with the wise word of Yeshua himself in Matthew 10 verse 22 from the Greek. And you'll be hated by all 
on account of my name. However, he that endure to the end will be saved. Amen. Shalom. Peace be with you.